It is just so good to be with you all again, Wild Goose. Uh, I've had my adventures in health over the past couple years. If you didn't know, I had a, a brain tumor, and uh, I had actually seen uh, one of the Wild Goose attendees a couple months after the surgery, and she said, wow, you look great for someone who had brain surgery. And I said, well, how do I look for someone who didn't have brain surgery? Because that's really the gauge. I can't live on that forever. But I am uh, just really glad to be with you. We are going to be uh, talking about empathy today. Now, I am from the northeast of the country, and I came down to, uh, uh, came down to Charlotte and started uh, ministry there. And at one of my first events, I was talking to my leaders, and one of them raised their hand, and she said, John, we're from the south. Can you talk slower? <laughs> and I said, I'll try, but you're going to have to try and listen faster. So we met in the middle, but we're going to go through some stuff today, and I'm going to try to leave some time so we can have conversation, and I'm honored to be here with Ken. Didn't know I was going to be here with Ken, and Ken is a hero of mine. You are going to be blown away if you haven't already heard him. I'm just going to move this fan slightly because it's turning my pages on. So I am glad to be here with the lovers and the healers and the activists and the caregivers and the damn givers. If you're here, just make a noise today. Yeah. So I want to begin with a question that I want you to ask yourself, and it's a question I've been asking myself. How did I end up here? Doing the work you do being involved in the ministry that you're a part of, caring about the things that you care about. How did I end up here? Now, over the past 25 years as a pastor, much of that as a minister to students, I found myself asking, how did I end up here thousands of times, right? I can remember being at my first middle school lock-in, watching a group of fifth grade boys dancing on top of the Jones Memorial piano, <laughs> thinking, how did I end up here, right? I was in Pennsylvania with a group of students and we were going to a corn maze. And we were making our way through the corn maze and we got to the middle and there was an opening and there was a TV with a VCR and a bunch of chairs and the, the man said, sit down and he showed us a badly produced movie about teenagers who went drinking and driving and died before they could accept Jesus. And he said, if you wanna get out of the maze of life, you have to accept Christ. And I said, we are in the middle of an evangelistic corn maze. And I thought, how did I end up here? <laughs> or I'm in Atlanta, and it's 10 o'clock at night, and we pull in with 45 students. And we said, yeah, we thought we were registered here. And she said, no, actually, it's not GA, it's CA. You're registered in California. And I thought, how did I end up here? <laughs> and I can remember the times when a student called me as her one call from the police station because she'd made a horrible decision and I was the person that she'd chosen to reach out to and heading down to the police station saying, how did I end up here? And then I can remember being at a podium giving the eulogy to one of the first students I ever ministered to at the age of 18 and looking out among all those people and saying, how did I end up here? So in both beautiful and terrible ways, I've asked that question, how did I end up here? And I imagine that you have. Because every minister, parent, caregiver, relationship partner, spouse, teacher, they all have their how did I end up here moments looking back retrospectively and wondering how they found themselves being where they happen to be and seeing what they are seeing and doing the work that they're doing, some that they may have trained for, some that they did not prepare for, and many that they did not get paid for. And in the best of ways, I think when I ask the question, how did I end up here? I like to think I ended up in those places because compassion has placed me there. Because an empathy that propels me into spaces I would not otherwise go and into proximity with people that I'd never meet any other way. And today we're going to stretch our muscles of empathy in the hopes that it will allow us to be more present to the people in our path, transformation agents in our local churches and arc benders of the moral universe. It's gonna be a full afternoon, okay? 
many of us are asking that question of the church. How did we end up here, right? We see the attrition. We see the growing difficulty of reaching and activating people. We're facing the uncertainty of life after the pandemic. We're looking across a nation and we see a rising expression of religion that while claiming to be of Jesus often seems antithetical to him. And we're looking at our nation saying, how did we end up here? At 2023, are we still arguing the value of a black life? How are we still questioning the validity of other religions? How are we still so infected by racism and bigotry? I think we ended up here because we are facing a poverty of empathy. We are facing a closed-fistedness that is infecting people, and it's even polluting the church. And so today we're going to sit with two fundamental wounds, friends. The wounds of the world and the wounds that you sustain attending to them. Because I bet you're ignoring the latter. And that's a big part of this. So we're going to wrestle with some questions today. How can I have a compassionate heart for people and their pain and not be swallowed up by how much I care? How can I avoid becoming a martyr of my own heart? How can we fight in a way so that we are not defined by or overwhelmed by the fight? Because I bet you're close some days. Because, see, there's a personal cost to compassion. There is a price to giving a damn, to being a person of empathy in days when cruelty is trending. And this is where we find ourselves. Compassion is a spending of itself on behalf of someone else. There is a subtraction to the care that you give. You're spending time and energy and rest and resources and relational activity with other people. And the question I have for you is, who or what is paying for your empathy? For the empathy that you extend, for the compassion you give, for how much you care, who is paying for that because someone or something is? It may be you physically. It may be your emotional health that is paying for this work, for this activism these days. It may be a relationship with someone else. They may be paying for your compassion. Now, if you've been with me before or you've read some of my writings, I'll give you a condensed version of the meaning of compassion. Now, compassion has its root in the word bowels. The original word compassion had its root in the word bowels because it was thought long ago that our deepest emotions were housed in the center of our bodies around our internal organs. And that makes sense because when we speak about empathy, we're talking about an internal solidarity with a person that reaches down into the very core of who we are. And we imagine people's pain and we're so internally disturbed as to be brought to sickness. So compassion being tied to the word bowels is a perfect tether. And I remember talking to a group of people just like this, and I said, compassion is tied to the word bowels. And we always say someone's story of suffering moves us. Compassion is a bowel movement. And the man said, that's because we give a shit. So shit givers, here we are. And I want to know what twists you in your bowels as you move your way through this life. What internally disturbs you to the point of sickness? And I'm not here to tell you to get rid of that burden. I'm going to tell you to lean into the burden, but do it in a way that is sustainable, right? In the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus looks at the crowds and it says, when he saw the crowds, he saw that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus sees people and he doesn't see what they're doing. He sees what the world is doing to them. He's not concerned with their behavior or their moral condition. What he is concerned with is their need and how can the people around him who follow him fill that need. So you're here to talk about empathy. And here's the thing. The empathy problem we have is actually 
a love allocation problem. See, Jesus calls us to love, and if we're followers of Jesus, you may not be, and I have been part of a Christian tradition. So I had to realize that Jesus says, I I have to love my neighbor, good. I have to love the least, okay, and I have to love my enemies. And there comes a time when incarnating these aspirations simultaneously is a virtual impossibility, right? Right? How can we love the vulnerable and how can we love those who are preying on the vulnerable? We are finite resources and sometimes something has to give. And I'm going to confess, friends, I'm really good at compassion for some people. I find it really difficult to have empathy for people who have no empathy and that's a problem. Few of us in this on this hillside today, are incapable of empathy. In fact, few of us are even capable, incapable of sustained empathy, which is required right now. But we are all guilty of being selectively empathetic. And the question becomes, how do we cultivate empathy for those we are most resistant to show it to? I don't have any answers. That's my talk. Thank you. Um, So I'm going to give you a couple ideas. In the work I do as a pastor and author and traveling troublemaker, people come up to me and they share their most intimate stories with me, which is good for you because you live alongside these people. And often I meet people after a talk or before a talk, and we have a couple seconds together. And they come up to me, and what they do is say, could I talk to you for a second And I say, sure, and they begin to tell me something that they've never told anyone before, something so personal. And in a few seconds, without any of their backstory, they're looking for me to give them something that they can take back to the relationships that they are struggling with. And here's the first thing I tell them, I'm going to tell you. Look for the fears and false stories. Look for the fears and false stories. Find out what people are afraid of and why those fears might be misplaced because no one is at their best when they're terrified. Amen? Why is so fear important to understand? Because it drives all of us when we are in conflict with other people, whether we're debating politics or religion or finances or work problems or parenting issues, the other person is almost always afraid of something. And that fear drives them and us to hold or defend a certain position, right? And often these fears are not unfounded. They're not necessarily false stories. The false story is what we tell ourselves about those threats, the way they shape and change our behavior. So we always have to ask, is the response appropriately proportioned to the threat? Now, we know from engaging with people every day that people's fears or their false stories are going to manifest in the politicians they support, in the religious beliefs they hold, in the way they respond to adversity. And part of the job of holding on to empathy in a cruel world is trying to uncover people's fears and validate them. And if we look for people's false stories and fears and we work to diffuse them, we can be effective in relationships and having conversations with them and understanding them even while not agreeing with them. I need you to hear this right now, friends. You can endeavor to know someone better and to see their humanity and still find irreconcilable moral differences with them. But we need to remember that what is true about everyone is our fears and false stories may be a barrier to a life of sustainable compassion. Now, Jesus' command to love my enemies always encourages me because it means I get to have enemies. I don't have to have relational proximity with everyone. I don't have to have affinity with everyone. I can declare and even disagree with and speak with specificity about what I will not abide. But I have to maintain the humanity of the person across from me and understand that they're probably terrified of something. So that's the first thing. Look for the fears and false stories. The second thing is be mindful of the grief that we all carry. 
in Minnesota, I'm in a sanctuary of a church walking through and a woman taps me on the shoulder and she says, John, could I talk to you for a second? I say, sure. And she begins crying. And people do that often and I try not to get offended by it anymore. But she said, John, I don't even recognize myself. She said, I hate how angry I am. I'm angry all the time. And I said, you might be. You might be angry, but there might be something else going on here. You might be grieving. I said, have you ever considered the fact that you might be mourning right now? And she began to cry harder. <laughs> and I left. No. And <laughs> And she said, John, that's it. I hadn't thought about it. But she said, I look back on the last few years and I think about all the people I've lost and all the things that I thought were givens that are no longer givens. And I don't know why you're here today, but I imagine you're here and you're grieving something, right? It may be the idea that you had of God or of country or of family or of the church. You may be grieving your belief in the goodness of people. You may be grieving the loss of a relationship with someone you once felt at home with. You may be grieving the loss of your sense of optimism about the future. And I want you to know that you're grieving and so are the people you love and so are the people you don't like and so are the people whose politics you despise. There are 8 billion funerals happening right now. And we don't wear them on our sleeves and we don't post about them on social media and you can't see them from a distance. But if we are cognizant of the grief that we all carry, we can have a tenderness to people that everyone else doesn't have. This is important as we interact with people, as we live alongside them, as we stare with them on our screens. We pass them on the streets, we rub shoulders with them at work. We sit across from them at the kitchen table. So look for the fears and false stories, friends, and then be mindful of the grieving in your midst. And the third thing is, I want you to actively confront the epidemic of loneliness. We are a people who are wired to be known, right? Even a serial introvert like myself who will give a talk like this and retreat into the woods for days. <laughs> I need this time with you. And you think about the need for community, the reason we go to the movies or read a book or look at artwork or listen to music is to see something of ourselves reflected back at us, right? To feel connected to other people, to find affinity in the experience of being human. The reason we create and express ourselves is to make that kind of connection in reverse. To say to the world, here's who I am, here's my story. And knowing that we're part of a shared story is often what tethers us to hope when difficulty comes. And that shared story is community. And we are always fighting the feeling that we are alone in our worries and in our values, in our fears, that we are the last of an endangered species. Have you ever stared at a screen and said, nobody cares anymore? You're telling yourself, you are the last remaining prophet in the world. And that's a lie, but it's spoken out of a desperate fear that you will be alone in what matters to you. And in times when we're surrounded by such tribalism, we understand that that tribalism is born out of that need to have our found community. I started ministry 25 years ago, but about 17, maybe, yeah, 17 years ago, I started in 20 minutes from here in Charlotte, 20, or maybe a little bit longer, depending on how I drive fast. Um, started in Charlotte, and I had a transformational ministry experience. I had been in smaller churches, and now I was going to be serving as a youth pastor in a mega church. So I was like the Jeffersons. I was moving on up to the east side, right? And I had this big gathering of all the students and their parents. It was the first thing that we'd ever done. We had this tricked out um, storefront and we had pool tables and gaming systems and a cafe and a giant stage. And we had every kind of thing that you could ever want, every amenity. And I was feeling the pressure to perform. And so I was in youth pastor mode. 
I was doing what I call hummingbirding, which is when you flit around and you say, hi, how you doing? Good to see you. Hi, hi, good to see you. And you can engage with people while still being an introvert because you don't stay around for an answer. <laughs> but I was at a gathering, hundreds of students and their, par and their parents, and I look at the periphery of the room and I see there's these two students and they're kind of standing like this. So I see that as a challenge. So I go up and I'm, I'm giving them all my best. Hey, thanks for coming out. So glad you're here. I'm the new youth pastor and nothing, right? And I go, hey, we got a pool tables and we got gaming systems. We got a cafe. We got a stage. Nothing. It's like an oil painting. And I'm like flop sweat. I'm like, I'm dying out here. And I said, listen, what are your names? And then I just said, hey, I hope you come back. And I kind of slunk away feeling like I had really bombed. A couple days later, I get an email from the older of the students was the sister. She said, I don't know if you remember us, but we were there and I wanted to let you know that we were forced to be there by our parents, which is what you want as a minister, <laughs> people under severe duress. She said, we'd had a terrible experience with our last church and our last youth pastor. And she said, we really were miserable, <clears throat> I could tell. And she said, but you seemed to actually care, and you looked into our eyes, and you made an effort to talk to us, and she said, you made me feel visible, and I rarely feel visible. And that changed everything about how I ever did anything after that. What a gift it is to see someone. What a gift it is to acknowledge someone's existence. And loneliness is at the heart of despair, and when we are seen, we are found. I was given a retreat in Boone, not far from here, and everyone gathered that night. People started coming to this retreat, and we're saying hellos and hugging, and this woman, she just burst through the door. Boom. She goes, my people. I said, I'm sorry. You're in the wrong room. You're actually down there. But she knew right away, based on some givens, that she was going to be known. And friends, a life that's oriented toward empathy acknowledges the universal sense of loneliness out there and we see behavior and we confront words and actions and we debate opinions and we call out injustices but we realize how much people are desiring to be part of something because when you ask yourself how people get pulled into hateful religious movements it's because they told them that they belonged there we look at a movement of cruelty and we ask, how can decent human beings get sucked into it? It's because somehow they found themselves feeling needed or wanted or seen, even if that movement is predatory toward them. And so the gift that we can offer is to truly see people, to truly find their humanity and welcome that humanity. So look for the fears and false stories. Be mindful of the universal grieving. Actively confront the epidemic of loneliness. And be a learner of story. Be a story learner. See, the fundamental mistake we make in our conflicts with people is thinking that we really know them. We, we think that we understand not just what they think, not just what they believe, but why they think and believe that. But that's almost never true, right? See, the truth is, with every single person we interact with, we are almost always dealing with incomplete information at the time. Even people, you know, most of them we encounter from a distance on social media, and we only see what they choose to share. They're selective, edited, filtered honesty, and we use that to determine a lot about their feelings and their motivations, right? People think they know me because they've read something I've written. In fact, a, a woman said to me, I just, she just said, I read 100% of everything you've published. And I said, you now know 100% of everything I've chosen to show you. But it's the other stuff that we don't share with people that we're talking about right now. Because other people we know a little better. We know them from church, or we may know them from our neighborhood or our so social circle. But we haven't been given access to all of them. We all are on our best behavior, right? And this and this, this truth, friends. Even the people we love and live alongside and know better than anyone else, the people we have intimate proximity with, we don't know them completely. You know why? Because after a while, we stop wondering. 
We get out of a posture of curiosity about them. So we don't know anyone, and I think that's what I want you to remember, that living an empathy-based life means when we're having a disagreement with someone or a disconnection, we say to ourselves, I don't know this person as well as I could, and then we figure out how to learn something more in order to solve the relational disconnect. Empathy does not stop learning. Empathy stays in a posture of curiosity. It is willing to be surprised by the other. I used to be an art student. That's how I began this journey. And I, one day, a Thursday afternoon, I was in Philadelphia in art school, and we're getting ready to draw a still life. And I'm setting up, and the professor says, put everything down, come on up here. And he stands us in front of this still life. And he said, this is a group of ordinary objects that people have lost the beauty of. They no longer can recognize the beauty in these things. He said, what I want you to do is become a student of these things. Pick them up. Feel if they're cool or warm, if they're rough or smooth. Catch the way the light reflects off of them. He said, become a student of what you draw, and then you will be able to go back and show people the beauty in the things that they have lost the beauty and reverence in. Friends, we have to become students of the people in our path. We have to continually realize that there is complexity and originality that the people in front of us are once in history, never to be repeated creations that we believe reflect the hand of divinity or a spectacular collection of atoms that we have never seen before. And I think many of us, and I'll confess, have stopped becoming students of people because we think we understand the totality of who they are. So this is all messy stuff. And I have a friend, her name is Susan. Susan is in her mid-70s, and she was born and raised a Southern Baptist. She is now a Unitarian. That's quite a spiritual journey, right? And she, after the election in 2016, she said, John, I'm brokenhearted at the division and how fractured we are. And I said, I am too. And she goes, I'm going to do something. I've decided I'm going to invite a bunch of women over to my house every Saturday to have lunch and play bridge. And I said, okay. And she goes, but here's the thing. These women are theologically and politically my opposite. She said, we don't agree on anything. They are my former friends. They are Southern Baptist friends. They're from that world. So we're going to sit in my home. So you imagine, I'm telling you this, that you're thinking, wow, how beautiful that must have been for Susan. And so many times over the past few years, she has come up to me and she said, John, I don't know if you still pray, but would you pray for me? Because look at the news. I'm going to have to deal with that in my home this week. And it gets ugly. But she's been telling me about the progress of this group. And she talks about the light that somehow starts to get in. And she said, one day we were having a conversation about the racial divide in this country. And she said, one of the women was talking and she started to cry. And Susan said, why are you crying? And she said, well, I just don't know why God made other races. Right? <laughs> now, if I had been there and I heard that, I probably would have really messed it up. I would have said something wise-ass, like, you know, if Adam and Eve existed, they weren't Caucasian, right? Or I would have said, the cradle of civilization didn't come with a cracker barrel. Thankfully, I wasn't there. Susan was there. And she said the most elemental question people of empathy can ask, tell me more. And the woman said, well, if we were all just one race, there would be no division, no ugliness, no racism, and we wouldn't be where we are. I want you to hear, friends, the beauty of that moment. Because what Susan's friend showed her is that this was someone who was genuinely grieving the reality in front of her. She just had a really bad understanding of what was going on, right? She was not a bad person. She was a good person with a bad story. And some of us are here, and we know what it means to have a bad God story because we grew up in one, and we're still processing the damage of it. 
Well, some people are still in that bad God story or that bad story of the other. And so that's why it's important to learn that. So we're going to look at the fears and false stories and try to keep people from being terrified. We're going to be mindful of the universal grieving and recognize that there is a funeral happening in our midst at all times. We're going to actively confront the epidemic of loneliness by making people feel visible and present and fully known. And we're going to be learners of stories so that we don't get out of a posture of curiosity about people. And the last one, I didn't know if we'd have time for it, and it's important. Practice some self-empathy, for God's sake. Because here's the thing. All of this stuff, it's not easy, and it's heavy, and there is collateral damage to giving a damn, right? Right? That's why you're so exhausted. It's why you're impatient and irritable and frustrated. And it's why you yelled at me in the parking lot for getting too close to your car. I want to give you a couple quick things. If I could tell you real simple things to guard the very precious resource that you have in the war against cruelty is yourself. And the first thing is I want you to engage and withdraw. So this is like a little two-step dance. Jesus models this. There are all these stories in the Gospels where the disciples can't find Jesus. They're like, Jesus, you have a 2.30 healing. Where are you? And it says that Jesus is in a solitary place praying. Jesus modeled this act of this two-step dance of engaging and withdrawing. He's doing, he's healing, he's preaching, he's teaching. But he goes back to a place of silence and rest and solitude so that he can recalibrate so that when he goes back to the crowds... Then he can see them with compassion and not contempt. Please don't do just the active engaging and refuse to withdraw. It will destroy you. Trust me, I know. I am an engager. Other thing I want you to do is if you want to kind of keep uh, an empathetic heart, I want you to get on social media. Here, but here's why. Social media allows you to do some really great things. To be informed to find your tribe of affinity who are not geographically connected to you and to perpetuate goodness with a platform that you have that no one in history before you has had. So you want to get on social media, you know, get that information, find your tribe of affinity, perpetuate goodness in the world, and then I want you to get off social media. <laughs> because what social media does at its worst is it artificially enlarges the bad news. Because you wake up in the morning and you see a story about a piece of legislation or some sort of act, and you say, I need the world to know this, and so you share it. And then someone likes it, and you know that they like it. And then they retweet it, or they reshare it, or they respond to you, and someone else posts it, and all of a sudden you've seen that story 12 times, or you've begun to fixate on it. And then you do that by four or five stories, and by the end of the day, or really by 9 a.m., you don't even want to get out of bed. So we don't want social media to make us, we want to right-size the threat in front of us, right? We want to be accurately, proportionately aware of and fearful of and not allow it to overwhelm us. So engage and withdraw. Mount and dismount social media depending on how your heart is. And these ones I'm going to move through real quickly. If you need them from me, I can send them to you. But I want you to practice strategic levity, okay? People go up to my wife and they say, what's it like to live with him? You know, they think I'm like a morose all the time and miserable, and I, I am, but, um, <laughs> but there are times we have to cultivate joy and laughter and intentionally seek out things that lighten our hearts or else we will sink beneath the weight of all there is to care about. And then I want you to get into your body, do something that intentionally gets you out of your head, right? Walk, exercise, play a sport, play with your dog or your grandchildren, sweat, allow your blood to flow and allow your body to take the focus off of your mind. I'm talking fast. I'm sorry. Well, I got to get this to you. And I want you to take a hope inventory. Hope is an aspirational orientation forward. Hope says, this day, I don't want to walk into it, but I am going to. 
and you take a hope inventory by collecting stories and moments that you see people doing something that makes you feel like all is not lost. And you cultivate that because as an aspiration, it propels us forward. And then cultivate gratitude because hope is future fo focused. Gratitude is present focused, friends. Gratitude says, I'm going to sit with what is beautiful and praiseworthy right now, even if nothing changed. No church changed. No legislation passed. Nothing was different. There is still life and beauty right now that we should and we better claim. Because the people who are drawn to cruelty have forgotten that the most difficult place to be is the intersection of here and now, and we are. And then, friends, I want you to know who you aren't. You are unprecedented. You have beauty and goodness in you that has never existed in the specific arrangement that it exists, yes, but you are finite. Trust me from someone who knows. A pastor said to me, John, if you fancy yourself a superhero, there'll be a lot of people who will press your uniform and give it to you and send you into a phone booth and cheer you on as you fly off. But the moment you come crashing down, they will not be there. No one is going to prioritize your spiritual, emotional, physical, or mental health. You need to do that. Know who you aren't. And the last thing is to share the load. Community is medicinal, right? You stepped onto this blistering campus and said, hallelujah. I feel better because I know that I'm surrounded by people who get me. The world outside of this tent is absolutely starved for compassion. And we need to be the people who they find it in. And the only way we're going to do that is by being relentless in our pursuit of a life that cultivates it in a sustainable, sustainable way. We have a couple, couple of seconds, a couple minutes. If anyone has a question or a thought on this, and then I'm going to close this, and then Ken's going to um, close this intentionally together. Anybody have a question? We have a microphone, but if you want to shout it, I'll repeat it, I think, because I don't know where the microphone is. All right, Terry's got it. Terry, throw that microphone back there. No. Go ahead, sir. Oh, yeah, let's do that. Sorry. I, I like when I make them set up things and don't utilize them. Thank you. It, it probably went to sleep, he said, like several people here. It's my fault. Not on. Oh, well, there it is. <laughs> now it's on. Yes. All right. So when I started ministry, I, I actually uh, was in Asheboro, North Carolina. Um, and I'm from up north. My last name is Selipak, um, which is a Slovakian name. Uh, it's an English derivative of, a, of Schulenbach, which is a very interesting place to be in the South, especially. And I remember my mom and dad, when they, um, when they came to visit uh, the church where I was an assistant pastor at, they come walking in uh, into Asheboro and um, they introduced themselves to the Sunday school class. And the Sunday, the Sunday school teacher said, sell a pack, what kind of name is that? And my mom and dad were automatically on the defensive with them. And, it, it kind of put them into, uh, into an understanding of where I was located in ministry. Um, in a, for instance, in a, in a church board meeting, we were, um, we, were being, we were seriously discussing the property that was up for sale next to the church because a black family had moved in two houses down from the church. And you know, when one black family moves in, you know what that does to the property values of the entire area. And this was discussed in the church itself. And I was um, realizing at that point, because frankly I had reached out to them and I was playing basketball with them, doing all kinds of stuff that a youth pastor would do, um, and realizing that my tenure at that church wouldn't be very long. 
Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it was less than a year. Um, so my, my, my real question is, like, when you're in the midst of it and you're trying to figure out who you are and what you stand for and um, what your heart is leading you to, how do you, how do you nurture that in the midst of the conflict? Because there are real conflicts. Yeah. And there are real places of, of disconnect that, that people are experiencing. Well, okay, a couple things about that. What we're talking about, friends, is always going to put you in a really dangerous and exhausting tension. The tension is between your convictions and your relationships, right? There are going to be those moments when what you know to be true and the values that you want to embody are in conflict with the people you know and love. This happens to churches all the time. Some of our church members don't like... We're going to have to mute that microphone, I think. Um, thank you. So sometimes the church is saying, well, some people don't like the direction we're going. And I always tell them, but the direction you're going is going to allow more people access to your community. So you have to go there and realize that not everyone is going to come along. So there are really t you know, precise tensions that we often have to push through. Or I've got, I think about... Four, five women named Maria. Let's just think, five women named Maria. One of them is a migrant on the southern border. One of them is a transgender teenager in Missouri. One of them is a mom in the Ukraine. One of them is a lady down the street. And one of them is your aunt. One of those Marias is going to be the loudest in your head. And she's also going to be the one you err on the side of the most. But there comes a time when we have to stand for the other Marias and invite their presence into the conversation or into our church. And that's going to lead to unfriendings, ghostings, empty chairs at the holidays, or ministry termination. The question becomes, some days we fight for the person we love, and sometimes we fight for the person we've never met before. And we have to try to do both. Both of them are worth it. Maybe one more. Anybody? Okay. So here's the thing, friends. We cannot be a people of faith, morality, and conscience if people don't experience that when they rub up against our lives. It doesn't matter the churches we belong to or the festivals we attend or the bumper stickers that we have. If people do not feel loved in our presence, we have blown it. So let's do our best to get it right. It's hard-ass work, but it's worth it. I'm going to ask Ken to uh, take us out today, but thank you for being present with us today. Love you. I guess I'll I guess I'll stay through tomorrow. There's been silence in the room. I think I know the reason why. Just about to cry Cause you've been doing this work For a long, long time and Every word that John had to say
So I suppose what I'd say is that he was so right and deep inside you know it well and deep inside you're ready for the fight to fight the impatience to fight the cruelty to fight the anger day on from this day on 